Good morning, everybody. Welcome. You are here with Biyachad Together, spirited by American Jewish University. The Biyachad platform was created as our response to the pandemic to allow for conversations, thought leadership, learnings, teachings to, to be together during this time. This morning, we are here together. My name is Deb Engel Collin. I am the relationship manager for the Miller Introduction to Judaism program. And this morning on our Biyachad platform, we are gonna be treated to an amazing conversation. And I know it's gonna be amazing because I know both Rabbi Feinstein and Rabbi Michael, Dr. Berenbaum, and uh, like how I changed his name every time. Uh, and they are going to be having a conversation about the book that Rabbi Feinstein, Feinstein wrote, In Pursuit of Godliness and a Living Judaism, about his mentor, the life and thought of Rabbi Harold Schulweis. So just so you know a little about our present presenters this morning, Michael Berenbaum is a professor of Jewish studies and the director of the Sigi Ziering Institute at the American Jewish University. He's a writer, a scholar, a creator of museums. He has an Emmy and a, an Academy Award for his work, and he is an eminent scholar. And Rabbi Ed Feinstein is a senior rabbi of Valley Beth Shalom in Encino. He's been, he served on the Ziegler faculty uh, of rabbinic schools here at American Jewish University. He's an instructor for Wexner, and he is just an amazing human being. And I am thrilled to be able to introduce the two of them this morning. I'm going to turn it over to um, Michael in just a second, and I'm just going to let all our, uh, our participants, and we're up to 342 at this moment, know that our chat function is disabled, but you will be able to put questions in the Q&A function, which is on the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, Michael, it's all yours. First of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Ed. Um, let me begin by, um, uh, we're going to ask you about the book, but let me begin by asking, um, what is it like to be a pulpit rabbi during the era of, of coronavirus? Thank you, Michael. It's good to be with you, too. And uh, thank you, Deb, for the lovely introductions. And thank you to AJU for hosting us this morning. And thank you to everyone who got up early this morning uh, to share some words with us. Um, it has been an extraordinary experience. Uh, in the course of just a few days, we completely reinvented the way synagogues operate. We, have, we put our entire synagogue up online, Daily Minion, weekly uh, lectures, cl evening classes, uh, sessions with children. Everything has been up on, uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. Everything has been up online. And it's been an extraordinary experience to see, on the one hand, how that limits us, because we don't have the opportunity to be together as a community. In a certain way, social isolation is the exact opposite of Judaism. It's, it's, there's no, it's very difficult to build a sense of collective experience and community when you're so far away from each other. And on the other hand, these tools have stretched our reach far beyond anything we could have imagined. So I get responses, I get questions from lectures that I offer, questions from South Africa and from Israel and from uh, American service people overseas and from folks all across North America. It's been just remarkable to carry on a community with that sort of reach. Um, so it's been just a, a completely interesting experience. You know, the, the, there have been moments in our history, I think I wrote about this actually, been moments in our history when it was necessary to reinvent the institutional structures of Jewish life. And this is one of those strange moments because we had to reinvent the way that we do things. And now every synagogue in America is struggling to figure out how we're going to do high holidays if we're not permitted to be together. The high holidays, of course, is the gathering of the tribe. It's when we gather as a community to reassert our covenant, our connection to each other, to our past, and to, to God. And it's going to be, you can't do it in person, at least not in large numbers. So the question is, how does that happen in this context, in a context of online uh, experiences? And everyone's trying to figure that out. And let's talk for only one more moment, because uh, I really want to get to the, your book, which I found uh, gripping, moving, uh, powerful, and um, an ultimate compliment for a theological book, clear. 
<laughs> uh, Thanks. Uh, there was a great phrase many years ago uh, about Martin Buber that his clearest writing was in Hebrew because he didn't know Hebrew well enough to write obscurely in it. Right. <laughs> but you wrote, a, you wrote a book that theologically is sound and significant, but also clear, which is both its virtue and perhaps its vice. Talk for one moment only about the personal level, what it's like to minister to Jews, to uh, be with them in moments of bereavement, and ultimately also in moments of death uh, from a distance. Well, let's talk about the opposite for a moment. I've had occasion now to do a number of baby namings and brisses, Zoom over Zoom. Um, we've, done, um, we've done weddings. I have actually three weddings this next weekend. Um, there'll be very small family gatherings in someone's backyard with, of course, with masks and distancing. And then at the same time, we've had bereavements. The agony of the bereavement of, isn't so much the funeral service. The agony of bereavement is that people aren't permitted to be with their loved ones in the ICU or even in the emergency room. And so to, to, to have to say goodbye to a loved one at the door of the hospital and then to be told by the nurse that they expired, that they passed away and not be there to hold a hand and not be there to offer a word of prayer and not be there to offer a word of comfort to the loved one. That's been just terrible for people just agonize. And by the way, it's not just agonizing for the families of which is principal, but I have friends who are physicians who called me and said, what do I say? I mean, these, these wonderful physicians who are trained in, in, in medicine and in bedside manner, but they weren't trained, they weren't trained to do a, a, a dying moment. And they want to know what can I say to the, to the, to the dying patient to hold their hand. And that's been agonizing as well. Um, we've done small funerals, and what's remarkable here is that the funeral is a small gathering of just the family, 10 or 12 people at the graveside, sitting in a small circle, and where at first you lose the capacity to welcome the whole community to grieve for the, for the deceased, it becomes wonderfully intimate. It loses all the sort of theatricality of the funeral, and instead it's a wonderfully intimate moment of a family gathered to say goodbye to a loved one, to tell their story, to recount the moments that matter. And it's also, it's been a remarkable reinvention of the way we do things. And that's been what this moment has been about. I, I, I wrote in the beginning of the book that there are these moments in Jewish history when crises forced us to reimagine and reinvent, and this has become one of them. I think it's gonna be a remarkable period and there's gonna be an awful lot to write about this period of time and it's also going to take us a long time to get back to the normal customs of Jewish life including this the sheer notion of an embrace even the joy of kissing in the Torah as it comes around right but let's switch for a moment um, to the book um, I think we should divide the book really into into um, three or four parts, which is really what you did. Uh, the first is uh, Harold Schulweis's life. The second is um, his thought. The third is him as a social innovator. And the fourth is him as a community leader and community builder. So what were the formative elements of Harold's life? Uh, we'll call him Rabbi Schulweis or Harold, because there's an informality, and uh, I know how close you guys were, and I always found him a source of, um, of wisdom and guidance. Tell us the formative elements of his life. Well, he, he's very much the product of a moment in history, and, and I tried to sketch this in the book. In 1938, he has his bar mitzvah. He was born in 1925 in the Bronx. In 1938, he has his bar mitzvah in a small shtibel somewhere in the Bronx. And he um, gives his bar mitzvah speech three times. He gives it once in Yiddish for his father. His father was an immigrant from Poland. He'd been an actor in Poland. He came to America and was a Yiddish nationalist, a follower of the philosopher Zhidlovsky, who put forward this idea of a rebirth of the Jewish people through Yiddish culture and Yiddish language. And Harold's home was a salon for Yiddish poets and actors and writers, most of them out of work, but who came to share culture in his living room. 
So he had to give the, the bar mitzvah speech in Yiddish well, for his remind, father. Remind us just for one second. This is the Depression era. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, very of, much so. So out of work is a communal is a communal experience. Yes, but it's also a, a, we may re-experience. It's also that's true. But this this was a certain cultural tipus, a certain cultural type. You know, the a Luftmensch philosopher poet. You know, who 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 lives in the world of ideas and doesn't need doesn't need material sustenance. Then he gives a speech a second time for his grandfather, his Zayde. When he was 13 years old, his mother began bringing him to her father, who is a very pious religious Jew. And Zayda teaches him Talmud, teaches him Bible. Zayda enrolls him in the Salanter Academy Yeshiva. Zayda is his tutor in Jewish religion. So he has to give the speech a second time in Hebrew. And the third time he gives it for his mother, who wanted him to be a good American. So the third time he does it in English. And uh, she named it. I once asked him, how did you end up with Harold? And he said, honestly, I think my mother opened the newspaper in the morning, and that's the first thing she saw, New York Herald. And that's what she named him. He, he, was, he was a creature of a culture that was being pulled in these different directions. Yiddish nationalism, socialism, uh, traditional Judaism, and, the, and, and America, the, the experience of the American immigrant. And these are the things that shaped him. The three experiences, I, I argued in the book, that the real psychological dynamic of my dear teacher is the, is the triangle between him, his father, and his grandfather. His father who hated religion because religion was cruel and authoritarian. And he spent his whole life trying to show his father that religion is an instrument of social change, an instrument of social revolution, not its obstacle. And his grandfather who sat and studied all day, who never worked. And he tried to show his grandfather that religion has to come out of its isolation and touch the world and, and change the world. And he, he tries to reconcile that conflict in his life. It's replicated again when he goes off to graduate school because he's studying with Mordechai Kaplan at JTS, the great reconstructionist philosopher, and Sidney Hook at NYU, who's a great American, well, pragmatist socialist is what he really was. Both of them took their doctorates with John Dewey, but went in completely different directions. And Schulweiss is trying to show Kaplan that Judaism has to speak to the wider world, to the universal world. It's the universal theme within Jewish life. And he's trying to show Hook that the only way that you can truly build a social revolution universally is by beginning in the particular, beginning with culture and its effect on people and how it shapes people. And that is the second triangle. It parallels the first one. And those are the psychological dynamics of Rabbi Schulweis's upbringing. And Kaplan for him really was, a, Kaplan was an enormously controversial figure at the Jewish Theological Seminary, but also an enormously attractive figure to his students because he really was the person who was pushing for the question of what does Judaism have to say in the 20th century and not the 16th, 17th, and 14th. Yeah, he used to object to what he called quotational Judaism, a Judaism in which you're nobody until you're dead 300 years. The story is Harold went off to Yeshiva, yeshiva College because he was in Yeshiva's high school beforehand. And he, gra and he, he gravitated to the philosophy instructor, Littman, and then when he graduated Yeshiva College, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. And there was a news story in the New York Times, June 1945, that a group of Orthodox rabbis met at the McAlpin Hotel in Manhattan to burn Mordechai Kaplan's sitter. Now you think about this, the Shoah had just ended, the Holocaust had just ended. And here's a group of Orthodox rabbis burning a Jewish prayer book. And the, while it was a great shanda for the New York community, and Kaplan was terribly shocked by it, for a young sort of revolutionary-minded young, young colleague, young scholar, this was the spark. And Kaplan and, and Schulweis read that story, literally read the story, got on the subway and went up to JTS to meet Mordechai Kaplan. He wanted to meet a man whose Jewish work, whose work to renew the Jewish people, was so controversial that the Orthodox rabbinate would try to burn it and put him into Cherem that's the kind of man Schulweis wanted to be with. And they had a lifelong friendship. When I was going through his files after his death, 
um, in 2014, I found the file of their correspondence. And, and it's one of the most precious things I keep in my office. I keep it on my desk because it's too precious of this. And the file continues from Harold's, from Harold's entrance into JTS in, in 1945 through Kaplan's death. Almost every two, three weeks, they, they corresponded. And there's this thick file of the, of the dialogue between these two, between student yeah. and teacher. Two great you revolutionaries. To, you, have to, you have to envy that generation which wrote letters. Right. Because you can, you can gather them. It's going to be much more complicated for us who write emails and therefore have correspondence that is quick and short and whatever have you. Yeah, worse, um, worse yet when tweet, when we have tweets, right? Well, if, if you can't say it in 120 characters, what good is it, right? Right, right, right. Talk a little bit about um, Harold's, um, and then Harold graduates in 1945. He then decides he's going to do what? He graduates, graduates college in 1945 and enters JTS. And then he uh, graduates JTS in 1950. And the Korean and they War. Send the West. Well, they're not yet. You see, they, they needed him close by in New York because he was, he was open. To, they, they had to have rabbis for the military. And they told him he needed to stay close to New York. So he stayed in the Bronx for two years as the assistant rabbi, <clears throat> excuse me, in Parkchester. Um, and worked on his uh, worked on his doctoral degree at NYU, and then in 1952, um, um, they they sent him to um, to to Oakland, California, and the the story is that uh, that Rabbi Greenberg, who was the vice president or the vice chancellor, wanted to get this young radical as far away from New York as he could send him. And you know what damage could he do in a place like Oakland, California? So he goes to Beth Abraham. Uh, mind you, he's it's 1952. The, the man's 27 years old. Walks in, fires the cantor, reorganizes the synagogue. Pretty typical Shulweis, and finds himself in the epicenter of every great American social and political movement of the late 20th century. Here he is, right on the spot with the rise of the civil rights movement. He is in the Oakland neighborhood when the Black Panthers are organized. He is a few minutes away from the Berkeley campus when the student revolution begins. He is just across the bridge from Haight-Ashbury and during the summer of love, during the hippie movement. He is in the middle of the anti-war movement. He is the center, the epicenter of all the great social and political upheavals of the 60s. And he becomes attached to all of these, to all of these remarkable, uh, remarkable moments. He's there from 1952 until 1970. We're living in a period of tremendous racial um, awakening. And the only comparable period that you and I can remember, and I'm a little bit older than you that I can remember, is the period that Harold lived through and was enormously uh, engaged with, which is the period of the civil rights revolution of the 60s. What do you think that... Um, what do you think that did for him? And how do you think he'd respond to what's happening today? That's a very, very good question. What it did to him was it, 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 it really, it gave a target for all of his aspirations to apply Jewish ethics to the world outside. That, this became his target. He was the only white member of the board of, of, the, board of the Oakland NAACP. He was a tremendous social activist in the cause of civil rights for African Americans. The problem was that from the beginning of his work at that movement, as time went forward, of course, the, the civil rights movement morphed into a black power movement and Oakland was its center. And as the Black Panther Party moved from being a breakfast program and a school program for kids of the ghetto and into a militant um, program, he was pushed out. I mean, the story that he told is that when his oldest kid had his bar mitzvah, the whole of the whole board of the NAACP came to the bar mitzvah and celebrated with him. When his second son had his bar mitzvah two years later, none of them came. There was a sense that they divorced themselves from the white community. And what ultimately happened is that in 1968, uh, he, he went on a trip. He took a little drive actually 
because this was the time when the Jewish community was pushing back against the purported anti-Semitism of the black community, of the African-American community, and was blaming the African-American community for having betrayed the liberal values that had united Jews and blacks together. And one of his friends said, come, I want a black friend said, I want to take you on a ride. Excuse me. <clears throat> it took him for a, a drive around the Oakland ghetto and pointed out to him the tenements and the pawn shops and the liquor stores that were owned by Beth Abraham members. And he said to him, it's not simple anti-Semitism. It's a sense of rebellion against economic oppression. And Rabbi Showweiss then did some, some serious research into this and discovered that, that that really was the case. That as, as it were, that the case was that the African-American community perceived Jews as part of the economic machine that was oppressing and corrupting the ghetto, oppressing African-Americans. And he gave a sermon that year, a brutal sermon. He published it later where he basically called people out, not by name, but he called them out. He said, if you own these businesses, if you are involved in this kind of commerce, you need to get out because no amount of our participation in civil rights is going to heal the damage that you're doing, both to the relations between Africans, Americans, and Jews, and to the reputation of the Jewish people and to Judaism in the world, you need to get out. And the truth is, that was the beginning of the end of his career in Oakland because the board, the leadership of the congregation perceived how dangerous that statement was. And they began to sort of gently begin to push him to explore other venues. And that's end up how he ended up coming to Valley Beth Shalom in Encino. So how would he respond today? I, I think that he'd be outside marching without a question because to, the, to him, this is what Judaism is. It is a response to the world that God must not be kept cooped up within the, the sanctuary, but the sanctuary must have windows and doors to allow Torah, to allow Jewish ethics out into the world. That's exactly what we're here to do. And that's why sanctuaries in a very real sense, by tradition must have windows. They must be able to see out and not only to be self-absorbed within. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk for a moment about the driving elements of his thinking, because what makes him unique is you have a social activist, a institutional creator, a, um, a person who speaks out of the prophetic urge, uh, who's never really been a professor, but is writing very serious theological work. Theological work that's not born in the ivory tower, but it's born in his contact, his engagement, his um, dialogue with real Jews who are living in their lives and who are searching for a pursuit of holiness, to use his words. What were was, energizing yeah. thoughts? He, he was, a, it's an interesting question because he, he was many times offered academic positions. And, and I used to kibitz with him all the time. You know, I said, you know, why do you need all this service for? You know, go, go be a professor someplace, you know. And you don't have to deal with, uh, you know, with boards who criticize you and with bar mitzvahs and, you know, and the day-to-day -day sort of work. And he, he, he pushed back. He said, I, that's what I want to do. Community meant the world to him. But partly, I think psychologically, it was because he was raised as an only child, um, and and he was, you know, and he felt the alienation of that. He, you know, he had a beautiful family life with Malka and their children, but he sought friends, he sought ali he sought connection, community meant. And then more than that, I think it was his conviction. You know, there's a very famous story in Talmud Shabbos about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who witnesses the destruction, the murder of his teacher Rabbi Akiva and goes and retreats in a cave for 13 years. And, and, and the, the question that the Talmud's dealing with is, does Judaism belong in the cave or does it belong in the world? And at the end of the story, God says to Rabbi Shimon, get out of the cave and enter my world. Bring the eternal to bear on the temporal. Bring the divine to bear on the human, on the worldly. And Rabbi Sholweis heard that call and really felt that. So he maintained his position in the synagogue um, worked with people up until his last days. I mean, his last public speech was in the, the April of the year he died 
he gave it the, the address at the Jewish World Watch march. It was very difficult for him physically, but this was who he was. It was his conviction that Torah had to speak to the world and had to speak to the lives of people. Now, his theology, as you pointed out, his theology could be presented academically. He published his PhD thesis in a world in a book called Evil and the Morality of God. And if anybody goes out there, if you want to read a book to and, and quote it at your dinner table and people will completely, un, no one will understand what you're talking about, go find that book. The last chapter is absolutely brilliant and it's very clear and easy to read. The rest of it is dense academic theology. But the fundamental idea of that book comes from his experience as a rabbi. He's a rabbi in a congregation, which means he's dealing on a daily basis with people's suffering. I mean, the story that he told me, and I know it's true because I happen to know the people involved, it was Yom Kippur the year he came to VBS. There was a teenager, a young man who was in the shul, wanted to go to a breakfast over in Malibu. His father said, stay to the end of the service. Let's hear the chauffeur blow together, and then you can go. So the kid agreed, and he stayed to the chauffeur, and he drove. He started driving out to the, uh, to the breakfast, and it was a dark night. He was on Malibu Canyon, and he made a wrong turn, or something happened, and the kid drove off the road, and he died. The rabbi gets a call that night at, at the breakfast, uh, at his own breakfast, about what's happening. So he gets in the car right away, and he drives to this family's home. And he finds that the whole community is gathered in the home and they show him into the bedroom where the parents of the kid is, are sitting and grieving. And he sits down with the father and the father looks up at him and says, you son of a bitch, you and your God, you did this to me. And the mother takes the rabbi out of the room and says, rabbi, don't take it personally. Shulweis, of course, took it personally because you know he, he feels responsible for having taught an idea this idea, and, and a rabbi takes it personally. We all do. So his theology is motivated by how do I answer that family? How do I answer that moment of catastrophe, of moral catastrophe, without, without saying I don't have an answer and without, without, without blaming the victim and without the brokenness of theology? That's where his theology begins. It begins in the encounter of human beings with the catastrophes of life. And that's where, he come, that's where his theology comes from. Talk for a moment about predicate theology. <laughs> so predicate theology is a, is, well, begins with this question of how do I answer the question, why do bad things happen to good people? If there's a God who is all powerful and that God is all loving and all good, then bad things should never happen to good people. But a rabbi who deals with people's catastrophe knows it happens all the time. And a post-Holocaust generation knows that radical evil exists in the world. And Harold takes, that's what the book is about. Every, every theology that he explored, he shows that it can't answer that question. And so ultimately he is forced to consider a very radical notion of what theology, of what religion is. And here's the exercise, it's actually very simple. I saw him do this, by the way, because we taught a class together. He, he would sit with a class of very, very bright high school kids, high school seniors, and he'd make two columns on a blackboard. Column one, God heals the sick. God makes peace. God up upholds justice. God protects the needy. And then the other, column was up uh, feeding the sick is godly uh, feeding the feeding the the hungrier is godly uh, healing the sick is godly upholding justice is godly protecting the powerless is godly how many people agree with column a and you get a few kids tentatively raise their hand and when you ask how come you can't agree with column a that's what the whole prayer book is about they say because the world is filled with too many examples that that just can't be true and then he'd say, how many people agree with column B? And every hand goes up enthusiastically. Because what he's done in that theology is turn our descriptions of God into moral norms. It's not about a God who's up there. It's about a God who's in here, who motivates us to do godly acts in the world. And instead of describing the metaphysics of a God who changes the universe, 
We're talking about what is expected of me as a human being, reaching for moral decency and reaching for the dignity of being a godly person, living a godly life in the world. That's predicate theology. In, in it. It's all about what we do in the world. It's making God into a verb. It's not a God I believe in. It's a God I act out. I am acting godly. I am godding in the world, if you want to use someone else's word. I'm doing the things that God needs done in the world. That becomes his theology. And so I once asked him, because he loved davening. And, you know, for a guy who didn't believe in God, boy, he sure davened beautifully. And I said to him, how can, how can you daven if that's what you believe in? And his answer was quite remarkable. He says, it's very simple. I just add two words to every prayer. I finish every prayer and I just add two words, through me. So if you think about that, right? For the God who makes peace in the world, through me. The God who blesses our ancestors, please bless the sick within our community through me. Blessed is the one who brings bread from the earth through me. You add through me, you change the whole dynamic of prayer. It becomes a personal statement of commitment to a world that ought to be. Tell us a little bit about um, what his agenda was and actually the institutions he built in trying to make the world a more godly place. Well, making it a less godless place. Yes, a less God, I think that's a better way to put it. Thank you. You know, you, Michael, your, your wonderful scholarship about not just the Holocaust, but the response to the Holocaust, Harold in many ways is a post-Holocaust rabbinic figure, post-Holocaust Jew. The Holocaust sits over him like a cloud, his entire, all of his days, entire life. And the question is, what lesson do we learn from the Shoah? There were those in our community, as you well know, because you've written on this much, who took the lesson that if the world didn't save us, to hell with the world, we should turn inward, become isolated, we should be indifferent to the suffering of the world, we should concern ourselves only with the needs and challenges of the Jewish people. Rabbi Showais felt that was exactly the opposite of what lesson we should have learned from the Shoah. For him, the lesson of the Shoah, and, and this is why he embraced the whole, the whole question of who were the Christian rescuers who reached out to save Jews. The lesson of the Shoah is our responsibility to heal and protect the world. Our responsibility to bring God, as you said, into a godless world. And that motivated him from the very first day. And it, that was his corrective of what he thought was the misinterpretation of the lessons we learned from Holocaust theology, from the Holocaust. You know, uh, we had a philosophical um, disagreement which ended up bringing us both into exactly the same place, but we came at it in different ways. Um, philosophical dif disagreement was that um, I have refused in my work to speak of the people who rescued Jews as righteous. The reason is pedagogical because I think that puts them on a pedestal which most people don't aspire to reach. But I spoke about ordinary people who were capable in moments of um, crisis to do the most extraordinary things. I wrote about the banality of the good, meaning that doing good is not out there. It's something within the reach of you and me. And he said, I disagree with you, I, I disagree with you philosophically, but I agree with you both pedagogically and where we end up, which is reaching out to people. And, and the other thing we spoke about often was why do we presume that God's presence is in the perpetrator and not in the person who tried to go against the perpetration? Why is God's presence in the Adolf Hitlers and not in the uh, leaders of Le Chambon or the people of Denmark or Ra Wallenberg or uh, any number of the thousands of people who did extraordinary things? 
talk about Harold as a community builder and institutional builder because this is the exemplification of his uh, of his work. Look, I want to I want to answer your first question first. This is a very very important point. Harold's in 1963. He was rabbi in Oakland. He went to a community dinner at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. He was the invocation of the keynote speaker. Benjamin Swig, who was a community philanthropist, owned the hotel and knew the rabbi. So he calls him over and he says, I want you to meet somebody. Right? I want you to meet the maintenance supervisor of the hotel, a German man named Fritz Grebe. So here's this gentleman, very large gentleman, wearing a, a coverall, talking to the rabbi in his tuxedo. And he says, Mr. Graeber, tell the rabbi your story. Fritz Graeber was a construction contractor in Germany. He was a member of the Nazi party, received a contract from the Nazi party to build certain defense installations on the Ukrainian border. When he was there, he witnessed what the Nazis were doing to Jewish villages, and it sickened him. As a German nationalist and as a Christian, it sickened him. So he started, he started conscripting Jewish slaves that is concentration camp inmates to do his construction projects because as long as they were on his payroll, the Nazis couldn't touch them. On the day the war ended, Fritz Graeber had 5,000 Jews on his payroll. He saved 5,000 Jewish souls. This is a man standing there in a coverall in front of you in a hotel during a Jewish community dinner. Rabbi Shoais was astonished. He said, what did we ever do to thank you? And Graeber was embarrassed and said, thank me. No, you don't have to thank me. I did what was right. That's where this began. And Showais, for Showais, this was a revolution theologically. Because if a person could do that, risk his life, his family, his fortune to protect Jews, and he was a Nazi of all things, to protect Jews simply because it was right, then Schoeis maintained that is evidence that God is ubiquitous, that God is in all things and in all places, because God is available, because moral heroism, because moral courage is available in all moments and in all opportunity, in all moments and in all experiences. So Schoeis's advocacy for the Jewish community to remember and to honor Christian rescuers was an extension of his theology. It was proof that God exists. That's part of, it's, an ex, a, complete, it's a complete logical extension of his theology. Now, the, the, the answer to your other question is this. The real genius of Harold Schulweis wasn't what people think it is. People think that the genius of Harold Schulweis, besides his beautiful writing and his magnificent oratory, was his capacity to come up with all these nifty innovations for synagogue life, chavrot and, and, and uh, outreach programs and, and the uh, counseling centers, the, 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 the para-rabbinic uh, counselors. That wasn't the, his real genius was to grasp the narratives that govern Jewish life, to perceive the flaws in those narratives and to correct those narratives. The narrative of Jewish life in the end of the 20th century was assimilation. We are disappearing. You remember in 1964, Look Magazine said, we're the vanishing American Jews. That was the governing narrative of late 20th century Judaism. Schulweis rejected it completely. He said, nonsense. We're disappearing, not because assimilation is stealing Jews away. We're disappearing if we're, if we're disappearing because Jews are lonely. Because you come to shul, you dive in an entire service, nobody stops and says hello to you. You have no friends in the shul, you go home. Jewish community is a myth, it's not real. It's, if, if we're disappearing, it's because it's boring. You come to shul and they speak to you in childish language with a childish theology. They don't ask you any hard questions. They're afraid to tackle the tough issues of theology. You go home and say, this is childish. If they're leaving, it's because you come to shul and shul has nothing to say to the demonstrations right outside the window. For shul the answer wasn't assimilation. It was to create a grown-up adult Judaism that spoke to the deepest issues that people were coming with. It's what Heschel said, the ultimate questions. Remember, Heschel's opening argument was that religion is designed to answer ultimate questions. We just aren't doing a very good job of it. We're no one's asking ask, those. We're questions. not even asking them. We're not asking the question. So, the question of community was: 
we talk about Jewish community. We talk about Jewish peoplehood. But do we even know each other? Do you know the person you sit next to in shul? Right? And the answer is, of course not. We come as strangers. We leave as strangers. Jewish community is a myth. So he decided he would break down that myth. He created Chavurot in synagogues as a crazy experiment to get Jews to actually like, meet each other, do Judaism together. And when he published this to the rabbinic world, rabbis were aghast. You mean they're going to do Judaism and we're not going to be there to do it with them? And Shulwai said, no, as a matter of fact, it's the greatest thing. Because he had this, this, this wonderful picture of a group of lay Jews standing around a table, making Havdalah as their kids watched from the staircase of the house because the kids had never seen their parents do Jewish on their own without a rabbi leading them. People had to learn how to make Havdalah. They had to learn how to lead a Seder for the Chavura. It was a remarkable revolution, but it was based on this notion that if you come lonely and you leave lonely, we haven't done what we are here to do. This he got from Martin Buber. That if, an, if there is no moment of thou, if the synagogue is simply a sanctuary of it, of, a, of, of impersonal functional relationships, then God doesn't live in this place and holiness can't abide here. This was his great corrective of the narrative of late 20th century Judaism. Now, let me ask um, a, a um, question. I remember when there was a discussion before the, after the um, illness and retirement of Gershon Kohn, there was a discussion as to who was going to lead the conservative movement, and that meant who was going to be the next chancellor of the movement. And there was a rumor that one of the people who um, people were turning to as the natural leader of the movement would, uh, was Harold Schulweis and that he was uninterested, he wanted to stay in the pulpit. I want to ask you two questions. Um, in retrospect, was that a proper decision? And what do you think would have happened with a man of that vision had he become head of the movement? Oh, Michael, Michael, Michael. Um, we should do a whole nother session on the conservative movement and I'll give you all my opinions and you can give yours too. He, I asked him once that question. Um, and he said to me, they uh, called you, him and- I'll give, you one answer, I'll give you one answer to that, which is quoting Yitz Greenberg, which is um, a paraphrase of the Groucho Marx thing. Right. Which is, I never want to be a member of a movement that I can't criticize. No, Gr Greenberg's language was more pointed. He said, doesn't matter if you're Orthodox, conservative, reform, as long as you're as long ashamed, as you're of, ashamed it. of it. Ashamed of it, right. I asked Harold. Harold said they called him and asked him to come to JTS for an interview. So he said to Malka, I don't want the job. But she said, but you have to go. They've invited you. So he went and he said to me, you know how when you're interviewing for a job you don't want, you just brilliant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so he interviewed brilliantly. And of course, they didn't give him the job. He didn't want the job. He didn't want to be the movement leader. He liked being with the people of a congregation and he liked the position of speaking freely and not having to speak on behalf of a movement. That it wouldn't have been the right job for him in any case. Um, the, the, the deeper question is the conservative movement and the ideas that animate it. And what would have happened had you had people of you know, people of such powerful ideas. He had a interesting, I wrote in the book, he had a really interesting controversy with Ismar Shorsh, who's the man who got the job. Ismar, who is a brilliant teacher and a brilliant historian of German Jewry, um, but, but, you know, was somewhat wanting when it came to being the leader of the movement because he didn't understand where the movement was or where American Judaism was. And Harold had a controversy with him over the issue of the place of ethics and the deliberation of halacha. It's, it's a fascinating uh, confrontation between two religious worldviews. But it, 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 he, he would have added something quite dynamic and remarkable that conservative Judaism lost when it lost, um, when it lost uh, Mordechai Kaplan and Mordechai Kaplan's principal students. And, and it, it, it would have animated at least discussions, probably divisions too, by the way, within the conservative movement that would have been quite exciting, even if they would not have been uh, good for the movement. Uh, but it, was, it wouldn't have been the job he would have ever wanted. 
Harold was not as close to Heschel. Though. He was very close to Mordechai Kaplan. Um, very close, his whole lifetime. Um, and someone asked a question about, did he, you know, how was he close to Harold Kushner? He and Harold had a very nice, a very kind friendship relationship. On Harold's 80th, on Showweiss's 80th birthday, I went to him and I said, I have a birthday present for you. I want to invite the best Jewish teachers in the world to come and study with us. So we invited Harold Kushner, David Ellenson, David Hartman, and Yitz Greenberg, and they all came. And we had this remarkable conversation, but I'm not, as a plug, the book that I wrote called uh, Jews and Judaism in the 21st Century is the transcript of that conference, of that conversation. Remarkable. And he and Harold had a wonderful um, conversation, but they came at things a little bit differently. He had a very difficult relationship with Heschel when Heschel was at JTS, when, when Harold was at JTS. He took Heschel's class. Heschel calls him into the office after one class session and said, why are you here? You disagree with everything I say. And Schulweis realized that Heschel wasn't looking for students, he was looking for disciples. And, Schulweis, and, 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 and Heschel realized that this young man was never going to be his, his disciple. They just didn't think in the same ways. But years later, and I think that it was under the influence of three heart attacks, he went back and read Heschel, started reading Heschel's book in Yiddish about the Kotzker and gained a new appreciation for Heschel and gave a series of lectures about Heschel, which were quite extraordinary. It's later in Harold Schulweis's life, he turned from his supreme cerebral Judaism to a Judaism that was much more in touch with emotions. This had to do with several things in his life, with his, the heart attacks he'd suffered, with the fact that his grandchildren arrived and he had a tremendous affection for them. Um, and, and with just growing older and closer to his own mortality. And he started rereading Heschel and bringing Heschel themes into his speaking and into his work. And it was one of the parts of the development that was remarkable for me to witness as his young assistant. Let me um, uh, turn to the people who are listening and invite them to ask questions on the Q&A uh, app down at the bottom. And let me turn to their questions. Um, um, let me turn to their questions and ask you a couple of questions. The first one's going to be very easy, um, uh, and that is uh, a woman by the name of Miriam, we won't use last names, so we'll keep it a little bit anonymous, asks, Rabbi Shuais would ask to teach us all of Torah on one foot. What would he have said? <laughs> he would have said um, all of Torah on one foot. He would have I mean, that was asked of Akiva, so why not ask it of, uh, of, of Harold Schuweiss? Yeah, I, I think he would agree with, uh, um, I think he probably would have agreed with, not Akiva, Hillel. He would have agreed with, with Hillel. Hillel. Your, your job in life is to live a godly life, is to connect heaven and earth, is to bring God to bear and, and faith to bear uh, on all of the things that go on in the course of life. And, and never to hide from the, the realities of life, but to bring the Torah that's been planted within you um, to touch the world that, that, that sits right there in front of you and never to be afraid, never to be afraid to speak truth to power. How much of Rabbi Shuai's impact was connected to the optimist of his, optimism of his time? And can you, Rabbi Feinstein, have the same outreach today? Um, it's living not living in a much less optimistic time. It's not opti It's not Schulweis's optimism. That was Kaplan's optimism. Kaplan, who believed that God was the power that makes for salvation, this infinite power that's bringing the world to its to its uh, to its to its culmination in the perfection of mankind. Kaplan was rooted in late nineteenth century um, optimism. Schulweis is a product of the Holocaust. I mean, Schulweis is an American and his family was here already, but in the Holocaust weighed on him. He wasn't, he wasn't optimistic in that sense. For him, you know, it was a question of the godly was there in front of us. The question is, were we prepared and courageous enough to pick up that challenge and to pursue it? He was in no way optimistic in that sense, the sense that, that social progress, that moral progress is inevitable. On the contrary, he saw a lot of the, you know, he lived through the, he lived through the, the various riots of, the, of, of Oakland and then Los Angeles. He lived through the Vietnam War. He lived through um, uh, so many catastrophes 
that that he he really had a sense that we we are given the godly as a possibility but it's in no way an inevitability so it's not an optimistic philosophy it's a philosophy that says that here is a way of life that offers you the capacity the possibility of both personal meaning and dignity on the one hand and real efficacy in the world on the other that's what's offered to you the question is are you prepared to gather the courage to make it real. Do I have the same outreach today, right? No, I don't think anybody does. I think we're a, we're a community of so many more voices. And at this particular moment in our history, there is so much, there's so much pol polarization that it's almost impossible for us to hear each other. To my chagrin. Judith asks, talk about Harold Showice's appearance in the film Unstrung Heroes. <laughs> Harold Showice had an interesting relationship with the media. He was featured in a segment on 60 Minutes for his work with uh, Christian Rescuers. You can Google that. It's on YouTube. He was, um, he was a consultant on an episode of The Simpsons. There is a Simpsons episode, if any of this means anything to any of you, when Krusty the Clown meets his father, who happens to be a Polish rabbi. Krusty turns out to be Krustonovich or something like that. And what happens is that Lisa Simpson quotes a whole string of Talmudic sayings about the necessity of fathers to come close to their children. Harold provided all of that, uh, all of that material to the writers, to Matt Gronig, the writer uh, of The Simpsons. There was a story that came out in the Times of Israel last year that Bruce Springsteen had a turn in his career when he turned from certain kinds of songs to much more personal, intimate, and romantic songs. And the music critic blamed that on Harold Schulweis, that Springsteen's sound engineer got married at Valley Beth Shalom, that Rabbi Schulweis was the rabbi at the, at the wedding, that Springsteen was in the wedding, and Springsteen listened to the rabbi's teaching about love and the meaning and dignity and power of love, that it so moved Bruce Springsteen that he completely altered the songs that he was writing, and so Schulweis is responsible for the best of Springsteen. And then somewhere along the line, Penny Marshall, Allah Shalom, blessing, Penny Marshall invited him to play the rabbi in the movie Unstrung uh, Heroes, and he went and did that. It took him two days to film it. And he and Malka and Nina and I went out to dinner a couple of weeks later, and uh, uh, Michael Richards, who played Kramer on Seinfeld, who was in the movie, was sitting at the bar of the restaurant, and we all got to meet him because he's a good friend of Rabbi Showweiss. It was fun to go out with Rabbi Showweiss because he knew everybody. And it was a joy to be associated with him in that way. But he had a wonderful career in the media. Um, talk uh, Marshall and Hannah uh, Kramer. And Marshall's a good friend, so I know that uh, he would allow me to go public with his name. Uh, we went to camp together. We go back to the old country. Uh, asked about his relationship uh, with Richard Rubenstein and Rubenstein's challenge. Uh, about the death of God. Rubinstein and Schulweis graduated in the same class at, at, age, at JTS, 1950. Rubinstein went into academics, um, ended up at the University of Bridgeport, um, and Harold, of course, went into the pulpit. Um, I asked him about that many times, so I wrote my, the answer that I heard him uh, give me. Um, Rubinstein wrote, as you very well know, one of the most important essays, and then turned it into a book, um, his, his, the question of after Auschwitz. And in, the, in his essay on after Auschwitz, Rubinstein says that the Holocaust once and for all puts away the Deuteronomic theology that there's a God in history and puts away any notion of a God who has any influence on this world. And Rubinstein comes out as an atheist in the tradition of Camus, who celebrates human courage in the face of darkness and absurdity and death but that courage, he finds great power. And he says religion's role is to give us the courage and the strength and to give us something to hold hands in the face of the darkness is the language he used. I asked Harold about that. And Harold looked and said, I don't believe in that. And he said, and more than that, the problem with that is that you can't say that to real people. You have in the world real people trying to do the moral, trying to do morality. And to say to them that the world is absurd, it is dark, it is meaningless, it is random, it is evil, is simply a crime 
when our job is to try to give people the courage to do what is right in the face of in the face of evil so it, it wasn't a it wasn't a theological it wasn't a philosophical or a theological uh, refutation of Rubenstein. It was an educational, a pedagogic, and a pragmatic answer. What kind Rubenstein, of person? Way, Rubenstein would have appreciated that because um, he told me the reason he could not go into the pulpit rabbi, and it happened when he was a pulpit rabbi, which is that um, an 85-year-old woman lost her 61-year-old son, and she stopped eating and went into a room and would see no one. They called the rabbi, the rabbi went over and Rubenstein was not quite natural, is not quite natural as a pastor. He went in and he said, what could I say to her? And he said, I had nothing to say to her. So I said, let's read some Psalms together. Yeah. And they read Psalms together. And all of a sudden, she got up from her bed and she walked out of the room and sat down to eat with the family at the, uh, the meal that is given after the funeral. And he said that's the moment he knew that he, what a pulpit rabbi had to do and what he did not feel very comfortable doing, and he had right. to leave the pulpit rabbi. So he would have, I, I think that a pulpit rabbi has a very different experience in terms of dealing with uh, real people in real need at real moments of crisis. Before Deb cuts us off, I'm going to ask you um, one more question that has been asked that, that really is what we would call in Hebrew, which is of the matters that are urgent today. You spoke about Harold Schulweis in the um, 60s giving a speech to his community. I'm now talking about uh, Ed Feinstein in 2020. And use the last couple of minutes telling us what you have to say to us at this moment of equal crisis, if not extraordinary crisis, in race relations. Someone's ringing here. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. You want, you want to mute him, Deb? Okay. Thanks. Bob. The um, I, I, I you know we 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 agreed to talk about Harold today, so I want to talk about Harold today. Um, so I'm going to deftly evade the question, and tell you, I I think that uh, what he would want to say right now, which I think is more 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 apropos. Um, Harold's deepest conviction was that the place you find God is within. And that means two things. It means the infinite preciousness of every human being. And it means that each of us can find within the power of transcendence, which is a power to go beyond our own limitations. And that's a statement not only about our individual existence, but about our collective existence. I think the moment we're living in right now is asking America to rise above its limitations, to recognize its shortcomings, and to reach higher and reach farther. It begins, of course, with rage, because this all begins with rage. It begins with a rage at the limitations that have kept people down and kept people and broken people's lives and broken souls. But it has to move from rage to aspiration. It has to move from Pharaoh to Mount Sinai from breaking the, the chains of slavery of racism to reaching toward a vision of a more equal, a more just, a more compassionate society. And this is the moment that we're in, the Torah's moment of the journey from Egypt to Sinai and from Sinai to a promised land is the story of breaking off the chains of that which limits us, transcending those limitations and reaching toward a vision of that society. I have heard and I've listened very carefully and I've, um, and, I've, and I've enjoyed and I actually cheer on, not God forbid the violence, but the, but the voices that are asking us to, out of rage, to break those chains, to break the, the, the bonds of, of racism in our country. What I'm waiting for now is the Sinai voice, the voice that says, here is a vision of the just society, the beloved community. Here is a vision of the sacred society, the sacred citizenship. 
and I'm waiting for that voice to be heard. Martin Luther King offered us that voice, right? Some of the great Thomas Jefferson once offered us that voice. The, 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 the voice that says here, I wanna show you where we could be going. I wanna show you the vision as King said, from the vision from the mountaintop. And I'm praying and hoping that there'll be a national leader of that kind of, of, that kind of stature and of that kind of power who can offer us that vision. Harold believed deeply in the God within, the God who lives within, the God who is accessible to us. And that's a, that as well in, a, in our collective life is his conviction as well. And that's, I think, what he would be asking us to do now, to envision that society. Let's, let me uh, ask two things. One is very simple. I want to conclude what you said Ed, with a very <clears throat> simple word, which is behind them and being hidden by Deb, which is that we have to do it together. This is a moment in which only together can we protect each other from the illness that faces us. Only together can we bring the economy back. And only together can we begin to grapple with the question of racism throughout our society. So I think that that's important. The last thing I want from you is to plug your book for one moment by asking you to hold it up because it has, <laughs> beautiful, has a beautiful cover. Uh, hold it up so we can see it a little bit more. Get your fingers out of the way. Yeah, I got to take it off of this. Uh, the, I got to take it off the screen here just for a second. You see my ugly living room. There. This is the book, Pursuit of Godliness and a Living Judaism. The cover was drawn by my dear friend, Hannah Drew a brilliant, brilliant artist who drew this portrait of Rabbi Showise from actually from a photograph, uh, but it captures him so well. And uh, it's available on Amazon. And if anybody brings it by, I'd be happy to sign it for you no matter where you live. It's very well worth reading. Deb, Thank yours. You. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ed. What an incredible hour of our morning of our time and so inspiring this is what exactly what we want with biyaha to inspire us to make us think and maybe out of our comfort zone because you challenge us to look to ourselves and what we need to do to create that godliness and that's not always easy um, to to look at ourselves and what we need to do so i thank you this morning on behalf of american jewish university Michael, Ed, thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful day.